Good evening, everybody. We're just waiting for our participants to all join. Just give it a couple of seconds. Fantastic. Okay, that's almost everybody. So we'll make a start. Well, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the online Nature Trek Roadshow. This is the first winter since the late 1980s that we haven't been out on the road traveling across the country, going to different venues, delivering our popular um, evening presentations. However, we're delighted to be able to bring it to you in a new online format where you can still all join us from the warmth and comfort of your own homes. I hope you're joining us with a drink um, and sitting comfortably. Our plan for each evening is to give you the best armchair travel that we possibly can, taking you to some of the world's most superb wildlife destinations. Tonight, focusing on wildlife cruises, taking you from the Arctic to the Antarctic and some fantastic destinations in between. Now, please bear with us. Um, this is a new venture for us, so we're quite new to this. Um, and we're really used to feeding off the spark of a live audience in person. So it's somewhat different for everybody, but we're really excited to be giving this a go. My name's Sarah Frost. I'm Nature Trek's marketing manager and a leader of our cruisers. And I'll be hosting tonight as well as presenting. And it's a dark, cold evening here in Alton, in Hampshire, where I'm speaking to you from, as it is in much, uh, around the, much of the, uh, the UK. But it really is such a pleasure and privilege to be doing something like this that's positive for you all on a winter's night like this, especially with this week's news of a renewed lockdown, to be able to bring these presentations to you and um, just brighten your evenings is what this is all about really it's what we want to do and we've been overwhelmed by the number of you who wanted to join us we have over 240 people who have signed up for this evening many of whom will be watching uh, with friends or relatives uh, and members of their own household uh, so we could guesstimate that perhaps over 400 people are actually joining us tonight which is just fantastic now if you're new to nature trek and the talks this evening tempt you to um, request a brochure, which we hope they will, um, then please do just email us at info at naturetrek.co.uk and give us your postal address and we'll be delighted to send one out to you. And in fact, at this very moment, our 2021 and 2022 brochure is at the printers and it'll be published in a couple of weeks time. And we really hope that later this year we'll be able to get a good number of tours off the ground and to get you all traveling again. We want this session to be interactive, so please do feel welcome to ask any questions that you may have using the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, be it questions about the tour or the destination in question, or even just questions about how the travel industry is responding to the pandemic. We're really happy to chat about all of this, it's what we're here for. We'll type replies to you as we can through the evening, but really we'll answer the majority of the questions at the end of the evening um, when the last presentation has finished at 9.05. So without any further ado, let's get talking about some of our cruises. Um, well, the key point of a Nature Trek cruise that I'd like to make first before I move on to my first destination is that most of them are, are, are exclusive charters, or so all of them um, are in normal times. And this means we have total control over the vessel we crew it with expert wildlife guides and you're on board with other Nature Trek guests who are like-minded in their aims of wanting to have a wildlife holiday. I've heard stories of people on cruises with other companies um, where they've been traveling in the Arctic and they've seen a polar bear on the horizon and the captain hasn't stopped because he's got a specific itinerary to stick to and um, a place to be. But this isn't so on a Nature Trek cruise. Um, we do have places to get to, but seeking out wildlife along the way is really what it's all about. And on that note, um, I'm now going to take you to the Maldives for our first talk this evening. If you just bear with me while I load my slides.
There we go. Fantastic. So moving to warmer climes than where we are right now, um, I'm going to speak to you first about our Maldives cruise. Now this is a seven night wildlife cruise. And if you just like to get your bearings of where the Maldives are, they're just south of India, out in the Indian Ocean, and it's almost 1,200 coral islands, which are grouped together into 26 coral atolls. Now, the word atoll actually comes from uh, Devehi, which is the Maldivian language, um, and it's the only word that we've actually adopted from Devehi into the English language um, that we use commonly. And atoll simply means uh, a ring-shaped coral reef, which is exactly what they are, and you can see all of them on the, uh, the image, the map on the right there. So just zooming in um, onto the main atoll, uh, you can see Mali, which is where we fly into. You can see the little airport symbol. So we fly into there um, and then take a 20 minute speedboat ride to a very close island of Bandos, which is where we spend our first day in the Maldives. And what a welcome it is. This is a real welcome to paradise. It's a fantastic place to uh, relax, acclimatize to the new tropical environment um, and get over any jet lag you may have, which isn't too much because it's only a four hour time difference. And it's a lovely spot to be able to wander around. The, the island there you can see from the aerial image is really small. You can walk around the whole thing in, in 45 minutes or less. And it's a great opportunity to uh, start getting into some, some snorkeling and see our first coral reefs and our first fish. Uh, we've got a, a parrotfish here, blunt-headed uh, parrotfish in its initial phase on the top left there. Um, and beautiful um, black tip reef sharks, the image on the bottom right there, I took from standing up on the deck that you see on the image above that um, at the restaurant. A lovely place to sit and just relax um, and ease into being into the Maldives over some cocktails um, and chat together on an evening before we board our boat the next day. And this is our home for the next week. This is the MV Kiana. She's a fantastic vessel. Uh, she has eight cabins and we take just a maximum of 16 Nature Trek clients. And the, the itinerary for each day is really just wonderfully civilized. Uh, we start each day by um, having a, a quick breakfast, a light breakfast, some toast, some fresh fruits and coffee. And then we get out for a snorkel and we do this before it's uh, too hot in the heat of the day. So we'll be out snorkeling by half seven. Um, we'll go out for about an hour, come back, have a full hot breakfast, a really lovely buffet breakfast. And then we spend the rest of the day um, moving into deep water and out looking for cetaceans, that is whales and dolphins that inhabit these atolls. Then we'll stop again for another snorkel session in the afternoon. And then in the evening, we'll anchor in a lovely lagoon somewhere, a quiet secluded place. Um, we'll do an evening talk, either delivered by myself or my co-leader, um, Dr. Chaz Anderson, who is the world leading authority on Maldivian coral reefs. So you're in very good hands. Um, and then we round off the evening with a lovely uh, dinner. And this is a traditional Maldivian breakfast. And um, this might not be to everybody's taste, but this is shredded tuna with shredded coconut and spring onions in a, a lovely wrap. Um, don't worry, there are plenty of other options available too. There's a lovely uh, cooked breakfast, um, as well as fresh fruits and toast pie. I absolutely love this. I find it really refreshing uh, with some fresh oranges to have straight after getting out of the sea on a morning snorkel. And this here is our very own private Dhoni. This is a traditional Maldivian boat and this follows behind us throughout the whole cruise and it's always on standby to run us onto the reefs whenever we stop and decide to go snorkeling. And it's great because we can keep all of our gear on board here. Um, so your snorkels uh, and fins, we just keep on here so you don't have to traipse them um, back and forth from your cabin. Um, it's really handy to have and it runs us um, right to the spots where we want to be on the reef and picks us back up again. And what a wonderful world it is under those waves. For people who are new to bird watching, um, you still are familiar with the common garden birds that you'd be seeing uh, fairly regularly out on walks and in your garden. But when you're um, not used to seeing fish and you first go snorkeling, it's just absolutely mind boggling. It's a whole new world. And there's so many different species to start learning. Um, and for the beginner, um, and even people who are quite experienced at snorkeling, it, Maldives is really a fantastic place to go to. Um, got a lovely coral reef on the top there, some blackfoot anemone fish on the bottom left, which are endemic to the Maldives, uh, and a green turtle. 
and this is how we spend the majority of the day when we're sailing. I'm anchored to the front of the, the boat um, and I never leave. Um, I reluctantly will prize myself away for some lunch, but hopefully some clients will bring me some food so I don't even have to leave. And this is because I fear missing the blow of a whale on the horizon. Um, I'm always on the lookout for them. Um, and if we see them, whether it's ahead of us or behind us, we'll turn the boat and we'll immediately go looking for them. But it's great when all of the guests just get involved and want to join me doing it as well. Um, this is a fairly common sight um, that we have on our cruise. This will um, happen several times during the week. These are spinner dolphins. This is a small group of, um, a small photo here, um, of about 200 that actually joined us. Um, around the boat and they're really charismatic dolphins. They're what I call a crowd pleasing dolphin. They love to leap out of the water and, and show off and do lots of splashing and acrobatics. And they're very confident and will swim on over to the boat without hesitation and come and investigate us and see what we're all about. But there are some bigger cetaceans as well in the Maldives. This is a sperm whale here and immediately distinguishable by um, the blow which is facing forwards, which you might be able to see from that photo there. They have quite a distinctive angular blow, which um, is angled at about 45 degrees. And this is because the blow hole isn't in the center of their head, it's at the front of the, the head and position on the, on the left hand side, which gives it that angle, which you can see from that photograph, which I took there. So we never know what's going to show up. It's really exciting. Uh, we've got some pilot whales here. Um, and going back to snorkeling, it's always an amazing moment when you turn around when you're out for a snorkel and you're faced with this. And this is just a breathtaking moment, the manta rays, and they're surely really a highlight for anyone who goes to the Maldives. Um, and when I was last there, we put some spotlights out at the back of our boat uh, when we anchored one evening in a lagoon. And I did this because I tried it a few times and it hadn't worked, but I was determined to give it another go. You put lights out on a dark evening, uh, lots of plankton will um, accumulate at the back of the boat. Um, and I was hoping that something might come along to feed on the plankton. And I was in the middle of delivering an evening talk to all of my guests. Um, and suddenly a call from the back of the boat came of manta, 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 manta. And my guests steamed past me. Um, and uh, I was, you know, quite offended to be uh, upstaged by a, a manta ray, but never mind. I was slightly disheartened that they weren't uh, more interested in staying listening to my talk on. Uh, marine conservation or fish farms, whatever it was. Um, but we went to the back of the boat and there they were, there were actually two manta rays at the back of the boat doing what I'd hoped would happen. And they were barrel rolling and feeding on all of the plankton. And naturally I said to everybody, you know, get your cameras, they might just stay for, for seconds. This could be a once in a lifetime opportunity to have them as close as this. This is fantastic, make the most of it. I was grabbing all of my guests saying, get to the front, get, you know, get there, have a look, take photos. Uh, well, four hours later, the manta rays were still there and we were sitting having uh, sitting having dinner out on the back of the boat um, and eating and looking back going oh yeah the manta rays are still there um, and they stayed for the whole evening and what was fantastic about this was that um, these manta rays um, have unique spots on their bellies so we were e able to take photographs of them in this moment and and at the time live from this lagoon load it to the Manta Trust website and actually learn some information about these manta rays as well um, so this one um, uh, here was called Jaquim um, and was a regular in the lagoon so it was great to learn a little bit about him um, and the, uh, the second manta ray rather wonderfully was called Kevin who had not been seen in the lagoon before, but had been seen around that atoll. Um, and it was great to be able to provide that data to the Manta Trust to be able to help them and just really added to our enjoyment of the evening. So just, just fantastic, you know, completely uh, to ourselves in a lagoon with no one else around. It was a really, really special moment. And other special moments that you can have in the Maldives include swimming with whale sharks um, now these are the world's largest fish. They get up to about 12 meters in length and swimming with the one on the right here, um, it's, it's, it doesn't actually look this big, but it was, it was four meters in length. And this is just a juvenile and they spend a lot of the time down at depths where they get quite cold, they're cold blooded. So they need to come up to the surface waters where there's lots of plankton um, and it's quite warm um, and they want to warm up. And that's when we can spot them at the surface and hop in for a swim with them. So it's a great way to, to round off a day snorkeling to see a whale shark and hop in with them. 
And I like to end my talks on a sunset note. So it's not all being in the sea or on the sea. When we're in the Maldives, we do like to get off and stretch our legs um, on some private um, and uninhabited islands um, and have a, a wander around too. But taking you now further east, I'm now going to take you to Indonesia um, and talk about our Bali to Komodo cruise. So this is a 13 day cruise. Um, and in addition to that, we can, you can take um, a three day pre-tour bird watching extension on Bali. So just to um, give you a bearings of where Indonesia is, it's north of Australia and it's absolutely huge. It straddles both the Indian and Pacific oceans. And it's really amazing that this is considered to be one country because it's made up of 17,000 different islands. It has over 300 uh, different languages spoken here and six different religions are actually recognized by the government. Um, so it's a real melting pot of different cuisines and different cultures, with some islands being vastly different from the neighbouring islands. It's a really interesting place. So just to zoom in here, um, we start in, in Bali um, and Denpasar, if I just move my cursor there, uh, that's where we fly into. And then we move um, for our pre-tour bird watching extension. Um, we start that um, in the northwest of Bali, in Bali Barat National Park. I'll speak about that very briefly just to um, let you know what it's about, if any of you are interested. This is the accommodation that we use for it. It's a completely secluded lodge and we stay in these really tranquil bungalows in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's a bird watching extension, so we're bird watching um, in the morning and afternoon, but if you don't want to bird watch all the time, you can always relax on the beach um, and go and sip a coconut um, I, or go swimming on the coral reefs. It's a really nice time, uh, nice place to just go and relax and uh, acclimatize to, uh, to the new area. And this is one of the birding highlights of um, a trip to Bali Barat National Park. This is a Javan banded pitta. One of my clients took this photograph when I was there on the, the tour a year ago. Um, and this is a really stunning plumage, this uh, lovely male here, which is only 12 meters in front of us. And we took this photograph just next to the Bali Starling Sanctuary, uh, which we visited as well. And this is actually another uh, critically, uh, another highlight of the spe highlight uh, bird species, but it's a critically endangered species. Um, they're highly sought after for the pet trade and after being um, hunted a lot in the 1990s they got to a state in the you know, early 2000s uh, where there were only a couple of them left in the wild but after a lot of re-releasing um, re and, and breeding programs they're now starting to slowly uh, breed again in the wild but there's still only a few pairs uh, around but seeing these actually flying overhead uh, while we're out there, knowing how rare these birds are is really something that's that's quite magical and worthwhile doing the extension if you're a keen bird watcher. But for the main um, start of the cruise, it starts uh, here back on the southern tip of Bali. This is our lovely hotel um, on the bottom left there. And you can just see behind the uh, red parasols, you've got the sea there. So after breakfast, you can go and take a stroll on the beach. And that's where we relax before we board our home for the next seven days. And the setup and itinerary for this is really similar to the Maldives. We go snorkeling after a very light breakfast, back on board for a hot breakfast, a really lovely, great buffet. You can fill your boots. And then we spend all day out uh, cruising in deeper water, looking for cetaceans and snorkeling again later in the day. Um, and these are just some images of the cruise vessel for you to see. You can see our um, the bow cabin there, which is very nice, the saloon on the bottom left, um, and the sun decks there where you can just relax and read a book and have a nap and wait for me to come shouting that I've seen a whale or a dolphin and you can grab your camera and come and join me at the front of the boat. Um, so just to show you the itinerary of where we go. Uh, so we start in Bali and then we sail east. Um, and this, the sort of natural history excitement actually starts as soon as we start sailing, because when we start sailing east, we sail over an invisible line, but it's a very important one. And this is the line of Wallacea. It's a biogeographical line named after Alfred Russell Wallace, who was the co-discoverer of evolution by natural selection with Charles Darwin. And when he was exploring this area, he um, noticed that when he left Bali and arrived on Lombok, uh, Asian flora and fauna gave way to Australasian flora and fauna. And he noticed that something wasn't quite right there and he couldn't quite quite figure it out. Um, 
when he arrived on the beach at Lombok, he was expecting to hear the sounds of, of woodpeckers and fruit thrushes and oriental barbets that he'd grown so used to hearing when he was um, in Bali and uh, in Malaysia and Borneo. But instead he was met by the screams of helmeted firebirds and Aust Australian uh, cockatoos, sorry. And he noticed that something wasn't quite right, but this is because 17,000 years ago, when we were in the middle of our last ice age, um, the sea, sea levels were much lower than they are right now. It was all locked up as ice. And all of the land that you see west of Bali was one great big landmass. But there's a deep channel in between Bali and Lombok, which is about a thousand meters deep. And that remained untouched. There was still water in between there. So that acted as a barrier, uh, a geographical barrier for the species there. And it was when um, he discovered this, he realized the process of evolution. So it's really an exciting place to be um, for historical reasons as well. And this is a uh, typical scenery um, of, uh, of the cruise. This is one of my favorite islands to stop off at. This is Satonda. Um, as you can see, it's an extinct volcano. Um, it's got a lovely crater lake there. And uh, we have the, you know, the reef to ourselves and we can go out for a snorkel. And this is me and my group heading out for a snorkel here um, and uh, going onto one of the many reefs in one of our little private dinghies, which will run us just onto the right spot that we want to be. And what a fantastic um, scene we are met with when we get underwater. And it's just another world. Um, these are cliff walls here. So I haven't taken this photograph uh, sideways. Um, above the water were steep black granite uh, cliffs. And as they plunge and continue plunging under the waves, they're just carpeted with these thick multicolored corals and you don't need to swim very far at all to appreciate them. You can just hover over one area for 15 minutes and continually be seeing new and different creatures. It's absolutely mind blowing. And it really is like being in your very own episode of Blue Planet. Uh, we've got two sea slugs at the top here. They're very difficult to find, but the guides will find them. Um, an octopus at the bottom and an anemone fish down there as well um, and some fish are incredibly difficult to find and this is what the guides are um, and really come into their element when they show you these things. Um, there's two fish in this photo, I wonder if any of you can see them, I'll give you a couple of seconds, can you identify any fish? Well we've got two ghost pipe fish here which are right here, there's one here and one here and they hang vertically in the water to look like seagrass so the tail is here and the eye is here and the nose is here and uh, a fin there. And the same with that absolutely remarkable, remarkable camouflage. And they, they don't really swim like other fish. They will just get carried in the currents and look like floating bits of seagrass. They're only about five centimeters long. Here's another one here uh, with a contrasting background for you to see a bit more easily. Um, and uh, yeah, they really are fascinating little creatures. Of course, it's not just small things, um, hawksbill turtle just there, manta rays as well, um, add to the mix. And we do get out for walks as well on the islands. Um, this is my group here walking in Komodo National Park. Of course, the highlight of which is actually seeing the infamous Komodo dragons. Now, these Komodo dragons are the world's largest species of, of lizard. They're about two and a half to three meters in length and can weigh up to 90 kilos and they feed on wild boar and um, pigs and buffalo and they have um, venom glands in their mouth which secrete a mild venom which is an anticoagulant um, and they'll bite their prey and, and then stalk it and, and kill it. And we can view them from uh, the shore as well. We have two opportunities to go looking for uh, Komodo dragons, one in Komodo National um, on Komodo Island and the other on Rinka, which is the neighboring island. And then a third opportunity where we'll take a private boat trip, we'll take our boats out and go along the shoreline here um, and watch them walking along the beach. And that's an opportunity where you can really get all of these uh, fantastic photos just like this. And I have to include some citations because I love them. Um, sperm whales can be seen on this uh, tour as well. Um, and this photo was actually taken by um, our video, a videographer that we had on board who happened to have a drone with him. Um, and uh, regardless of what you may think of drones, they really do revolutionize the way that you're able to view uh, cetaceans. So from on board, we're able to see the tail and the back of this 
sperm whale, but by taking this photograph and then showing it to our guests later, we were able to learn so much more about the animal that we've been watching. You can see all of its white marks all around its mouth, and this is where it's been battling giant squid at depths of one or 2,000 meters below the surface. Um, it's a really big adult, probably a male, and it just adds a really wonderful extra dimension uh, to our enjoyment of the trip. Other cetaceans um, include false killer whales, melon-headed whales, um, spotted dolphins, spinner dolphins, frasers, rissos. Um, there's a huge variety um, out there, along with blue whales, um, Cuvier's beaked whales, dwarf sperm whales as well. Um, got some uh, pantropical spotted dolphins there. And I will again finish on a sunset. Um, this is uh, a photograph I took on our last uh, evening on board the boat when we were there a year ago, and you can just see some melon-headed whales dotted underneath uh, the sun there. Now, I'll now hand you over to Paul. If you do have any questions about either the Maldives or Indonesia, please do just type them uh, in the questions box and we can chat about it afterwards. Thank you very much and over to Paul. Thank you very much, Sarah. One moment while I um, open up my presentation. Okay. Sorry, so is, is that is that showing okay? Uh, I can't see it yet, Paul. Oh, sorry, minor technical hitch. Sorry about this. That's all right. It's typical. Right, hang on a second. Ah, right. Okay, we're nearly there now. We're nearly there. Right. Okay. Go. Right. Oh, sorry about that technical hitch, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for tuning in. Um, my name's Paul Stanbury. Um, I'm one of the operations managers at Nature Trek. Been working uh, with Nature Trek now since uh, since 1996. Um, and I look after a range of our tours, Saharan Africa. Um, some trips in South America and North America, but I'm particularly look, um, very interested and look after a lot of our cruises. Um, and this evening, I'm going to be talking to you about my two favourite areas, the poles up around the, the Arctic and then down to, to Antarctica. Um, so as, as Sarah mentioned, um, we do a wide range of cruises throughout the world. Um, in normal times, we um, tend to charter the whole vessel, um, which gives you the um, uh, gives us the ability to be able to um, dictate the, the route of the cruise, take on our own tour leaders, and make sure we can focus the, the trip on, on wildlife and the scenery and the things that us and our clients are interested in. And we've been doing trips, um, cruises now up to Spitsbergen, well, for almost as long as I've been with Nature Trek, well over 20 years. Um, and in 2006, to celebrate Nature Trek's 20th an uh, anniversary, we chartered a ship. Um, and we've been chartering ships um, ever, ever since. Now, Spitsbergen is probably one of my, my, my favourite areas of, of the world. You're right up in the high Arctic here. It's the most accessible region of the high Arctic um, for us in the UK uh, to visit. You see on this map here, uh, it's north of North Norway. Um, and uh, so it's up here, um, about halfway between North Norway and, uh, and the North Pole. Um, and it's a close up here of the, of the island. So Spitsbergen itself is the largest island within the, the Svalbard um, archipelago. Um, we fly from, from the UK up to Norway, up to, up to um, Oslo, overnight in Oslo, and then fly up to, to Longyearbyen. And Longyearbyen is, is the administrative capital of, um, of Spitsbergen, of Svalbard. 
sitting on the edge of Isfjord. I mean, in Hop on our ship, we do our fits, we tend to do most of our Spitsbergen cruises late June into early July. And at this time of year, in the middle of the summer, um, when the ice is normally melted sufficiently to be able to, for, you, for us to be able to explore um, the areas uh, we want to. So we fly into Longyearbyen. And then so the idea is to circumnavigate the island of Spitsbergen, heading north out of Isfjord, around Prince Carl's Foreland, down through the, the Hinlopen Strait between uh, Nordauslandet and Spitsbergen, um, and then back around the southern tip and up to Isfjord again. But this will depend very much on the ice conditions, and it actually doesn't matter at all whether um, we circumnavigate the island, whether we just get up to the north or explore the east, wherever you go in Spitsbergen, there's fantastic scenery and fantastic wildlife um, to enjoy. So this, this is where we start. We fly up to Longyearbyen, um, and Longyearbyen is the, the, the Ministry of Capital, a small Arctic town um, on the edge of a small field called Advent Field. Um, and we normally have a couple of hours just to explore around the town, do a little bit of shopping, just to see what it's like, to see what life is like in an Arctic town, or to do some, some bird watching um, along the coast. Even here, you're going to see your, your first Arctic species. Um, Arctic tern are very common. Um, and these birds, of course, fresh in from their other summer down in Antarctica. These are, they, these are nesting up to above 80 degrees uh, north. And wherever you're walking along the, um, the, the foreshore in, um, in Longyearbyen, you're often surrounded by these, these um, very beautiful um, birds. There are also snow buntings here. This is actually probably the best place in Spitsbergen to, to see snow buntings. They, they nest um, under the eaves of the buildings and they're commonly seen throughout, um, throughout the town. Um, as well as, um, um, as, well as the snow bunters are also um, purple sandpipers, Arctic skewers, and a variety of other birds to enjoy before we hop on our ship. And this is the ship that we've been using for the past few years, the MS Quest. She takes um, 50 people, very comfortable, ice strengthened, enough Zodiacs for everybody to go out at the same time. So a very comfortable range of different cabins to, um, um, to stay in. The top one top left is the standard twin cabin. All cabins have windows. They all are en suite with a toilet and shower. So if you want to upgrade to a larger, more comfortable cabin, then you can do. The one on the right is a double. Then we've got a superior bottom left. But the other great thing about this particular vessel is she has uh, on the upper deck an observation lounge. So when we're not out looking at the, at the wildlife or out on shore, you can sit up in the, up in the observation lounge, a cup of tea, a cup of coffee or, or a beer, and just watch the world go by and watch this fantastic scenery and, and enjoy the wildlife. And they also give uh, the nature trek guides and the expedition staff also give uh, lectures um, as well. So once we're on board the ship, we'll head out and we're on our cruises typically have nine nights um, up, up, in, up in Spitsbergen. We head north up the coast and spectacular scenery all around. The, the uh, west coast of Spitsbergen is just that little bit warmer than the eastern side because the Gulf Street peters out along the west coast of the archipelago. Um, and so here you tend to get most of the tundra vegetation and a, probably a greater variety of birds and other wildlife to enjoy. There are lots of barnacle geese. Barnacle geese are the commonest geese in, in Svalbard. This population winters down um, in um, Claverock in Scotland. Grey phalaropes, so they're one of the commonest waders um, out, on the, out on the tundra. Here we've got a family group, the female being the brightest of the, of, of, of the trio, and the female at the back, and then the male, and then the little chick uh, down in the foreground. Um, beautiful long-tailed skewer. Uh, it's not a common bird in Spitsbergen, um, but it can be seen, um, especially on the west coast or when you're out in the pack ice. Um, and for birders, one of the key species to see is the beautiful king ida. Um, and they are often seen mixed in amongst common ida. So wherever you see a flock of common ida in the fjords, keep your eyes open and you might see, should see, hopefully one of these um, beautiful sea ducks. Um, the great thing about going in June, we're in the height of the summer, so there's not only the birds to enjoy in the landscapes, but the tundra becomes a wash of, of, of a variety of different colours. Um, botany up here it actually is, is really quite amazing. I was staggered the first time I went up to Spitsberg and just the variety and the colour of the, of the plants to enjoy. I would always, always make sure there's somebody on board the vessel who can identify the plants for you. This is purple saxifrage, the uh, beautiful uh, boreal uh, Jacob's Ladder, um, 
And um, I suppose the botany, there's a few mammals to enjoy. Um, there's only two species of land mammal in Svalbard. You've got here the Svalbard reindeer. It's a, it's a particular uh, subspecies race that's endemic to, to the island. It almost looks like a bit of a Shet Shetland pony with, with antlers. The bird life's fantastic. You're not going to get a huge range of uh, different species, but what you lack in diversity, more than make up for in sheer numbers. Huge numbers of Brunix guillemot breed along the cliffs. Um, over a million pairs of little orcs breed in, in Svalbard. So one of the real highlights of a trip is to go to a little orc colony and you can sit down on the rocks and within, say, within minutes you're surrounded by these wonderful little tennis ball sized birds all chittering and cackling away to each other. Um, wherever you're around a seabird colony, keep your eyes open for Arctic foxes. Um, these are a land mammal, but in the winter time, they tend to follow polar bears out on the pack ice and scavenge on the kills. Um, in the summer, they're found around seabird colonies. This, the, the scenery and the landscapes, wherever you go in Svalbard, is absolutely spectacular. Massive glaciers like the Monaco Glacier here, um, backed by Spitsbergen. Spitsbergen means jagged mountain. And then we'll be looking for the pack ice. And because we, we, we tend to go, we go late June, early July, there's normally pack ice around. The vessels we use are ice strengthened so we can head out into the pack ice um, and not only enjoy the experience of being in, out in, the, in the, this icy realm, but looking for some of the key animals and birds that live out in the ice. One of the birders' favourites is the ivory gull, a ghostly white gull that lives permanently um, above 72 degrees north. Um, and uh, again, like, um, like the Arctic foxes follow polar bears in the winter. Plenty of seals out in the pack ice. This is a bearded seal, the largest of the seal species. Um, but whenever you see plenty of seals, of course, you've got to keep your eyes open for the king of the Arctic itself, the polar bear. Um, and we're well aware that uh, the main, one of the key species people want to see on these cruises are bears. And when we're normally lucky that so we've been operating trips to Spitsbergen for um, well over 20 years and only one occasion where we've missed polar bears. And that was simply because there was too much ice around on that particular year and you couldn't get out into the areas where the bears tended to favour. Um, but we're normally pretty lucky with bears. You can get really nice sightings of them. There's about two and a half thousand polar bears that uh, range along the Barents Sea area between Spitsbergen and Franz Josef Land, with two to three hundred of them um, tending to, to hang around Spitsbergen Island and, and, and the Svalbard Archipelago. The other big mammal we're looking out for are the walrus. Um, these are very heavily hunted back in the 17th century, but the numbers are slowly recovering um, and we'll certainly take you to walrus hall out so you see them out on the beach and in the water as well. Other animals that were very heavily hunted were the, were the whales and uh, cetaceans, um, but numbers again gradually building up. Um, it was only in the past 10 years that we started seeing blue whales again up in Svalbard, and now our groups are typically seeing blues every year. One animal that was still only, we've only seen, I think on two, two occasions is the bowhead whale. And this is still an incredibly rare animal. It used to be the commonest whale up and around the Svalbard in front of Joseph land, but was the, the one of be, being a member of the right whale family. It was considered the right whale to hunt and the numbers um, were, were absolutely decimated. But again, very slowly coming back. We might just be lucky. Tonight is interesting history as well um, to, to enjoy. We certainly won't ignore the history. Um, Spitsbergen was the stomping off place for a lot of the, um, the Arctic explorers on their, their trips to visit the North Pole. But you don't, at least you don't have to worry about daylight hours in Svalbard. Um, in the middle of, of um, in the end of June, you've got 24 hour daylight and this is the lowest the sun will get in the sky during your entire trip. So the only problem is finding the opportunity um, to, to sleep. But it's a wonderful destination, fantastic for its, for its wildlife and scenery uh, and a real um, uh, uh, say fantastic place to go. But going from north down to down to the south, now I'm just going to take you on a very brief uh, trip around um, Antarctica. Um, and uh, like Spitsbergen, we, we, we tend to uh, charter our ships for Antarctica. We don't do them every year. We do one every two or three years. Um, the next one will be in November this year, and this, this one will be particularly special because it's time to coincide with the with the solar eclipse that crosses over the Weddell Sea at the beginning of um, December. So the route of the trip, we fly into Buenos Aires in Argentina and then down to Ushuaia. Um, from Ushuaia, we hop on the ship and cruise to the Falklands for several days, then to, to South Georgia, 
from South Georgia down to the Antarctic Peninsula, stopping hopefully to see the eclipse en route, and then from the peninsula back to Ushuaia again. 19, nines, 19 nights on the ship, 24 day holiday uh, in total. This is the ship that we use for, for Antarctica. She's called the Ortelius, takes 100 people. It's about double the size of the, uh, of, of the ship in Spitsbergen. But we want a larger ship down in Antarctica because the waters, of course, are a little choppier down south. So the ship is, is just is, is big enough to be, to be stable on the, on the Southern Oceans. Again, a, a range of very comfortable cabins, all en suite. Um, top left is the cabin with porthole, which is a standard cabin. You can upgrade to cabin with windows and superiors. Um, we embark in Ushuaia, um, the southernmost city um, in, um, in the Americas, um, backed by the wonderful jagged peaks of the Andes. And then we head out on, into the sea on the crossing to um, the Falklands. And what the great thing about this cruise, whenever you're out at sea, there's always plenty to enjoy. For the seabird enthusiast, this is really is the trip to go on. There's never a dull moment. Your ship, the ship's always being followed by a wonderful variety of petrels and shearwaters and albatrosses. It will test your seabird identification to the um, to, to the to the limit. Here, top uh, top left, we have white chin petrel, great shearwater to the right, and then the the wonderful little um, Wilson storm petrel, bottom left, one of the most abundant seabirds in the world. We arrive on the Falklands after a day or so uh, crossing. Um, and we've got a couple of days to explore the Falklands. Typically, the trips tend to stop off at Carcass and Saunders Island in the northwest corner um, of, of the archipelago, northwest of the west-west Falkland. And then we have a morning in, in the capital in Stanley at the end before heading back out to sea again. Um, and so we're doing zodiac landings every day, typically one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And this is the case for, for the whole trip when we're on near land. Rockhopper penguins, of course, probably the star bird of, of, of any trip to the Falkland uh, Islands. Wonderfully little comical birds, and they nest um, on Saunders Island in, in, in good numbers. Very close, actually, to the black-browed albatross colony. So the one, the real, the two highlights of the Falklands for me was the visit to the rockhopper colony and the um, black-browed albatross colony. But as well as these, these seabirds, the Falklands have, are home to several endemic species, including the Blackish Syncloides, the, the, the so-called tussock bird, which is endemic to the islands. So once we've been to Stanley, we head out back to sea again on a two-day crossing to South Georgia. And again, there's lots of wonderful seabirds to enjoy. As we cross the Antarctic Convergence, which is the boundary between the uh, warmer waters to the north and the colder polar waters around Antarctica itself, we have a different assemblage of species um, appear. Wandering albatross, um, the bird of course in the world with the longest wingspan commonly seen, so go from one of the largest down to one of the smallest, and little black-bellied storm petrel becomes commoner as well as you cross the convergence into colder waters. And then we end up in, in South Georgia itself. For, for, for me, it was a, it was a fab, the whole trip was fabulous, but South Georgia was just particularly special. The scenery is just absolutely amazing, wonderful, jagged, snow-capped mountains, huge glaciers, and the wildlife just absolutely blew me away. Um, of course, penguins. There are one or two penguins um, on South Georgia. This is a, a close-up of a king penguin. When I say one or two penguins, I actually mean one or two million penguins. Um, there are vast numbers of king penguins um, on the island. This is a place called St Andrews Bay, probably one of the most amazing places I've ever been to in my life. Over 150,000 pairs of king penguins. And when you add to that the chicks and the non-breeding birds, you've probably got over half a million birds at this one site. And where we go to get this amazing view is the same place that David Attenborough stood in Trials of Life. So it really is an absolutely wonderful um, experience. The difficult thing in, in, the, in South Georgia is staying far enough away from the animals. You're told you can't get any more than about four metres, but that's impossible because they will come right up to you. Wonderful photographic opportunities throughout and a wonderful experience to be so close to these amazing creatures. As well as the kings, we've got other species of penguins, macaroni penguins, um, these are the macaronis, uh, chinstrap penguins, as well, a variety of different albatrosses. Um, there's uh, South Georgia pintail, endemic pintail, endemic duck to the islands. And again, like Spitsbergen, we don't ignore the history. And, the, and you can't go to South Georgia without visiting the grave of one of the world's um, great polar explorers, um, Ernest Shackleton. 
is is buried in Gridviken, and it's a bit of, it's sort of a pilgrimage to go and visit his grave um, when we're on the island. Then we leave South Georgia and we head south um, towards the Antarctic Peninsula. The cold, the waters get colder. We get a different variety of birds. Snow petrel here, Antarctic petrel. Some spectacular scenery, large numbers of birds to enjoy. These are actually all Antarctic petrels. Um, one of the one of the one of the rarer of the petrel species, and say so one of the real highlights of this particular trip, the reason we've timed it for November, early December, is to coincide with the, the total solar eclipse that passes over um, the Weddell Sea on the 4th of December, 2021. So we will position ourselves where we have that red arrow. Um, the purple line in the middle of the two blue lines is the line of totality, where the, the total eclipse, it, where the eclipse is total. So we will position ourselves under the line of totality on the 4th of December, look up, and hopefully weather permitting, enjoy one of the one of the uh, um, one of the university's great um, spectacles, surrounded by pack ice and in one of the most magical places on the planet. And then we end down in Antarctica itself, where we explore the Antarctic Peninsula again, spectacular scenery all around. There really is nowhere like it um, on on Earth. We do cruising around massive glaciers, massive icebergs, huge mountains and will enjoy some of the wildlife as well. Chinstrap penguins nest down in Antarctica in, the, in their millions. And we'll also visit a colony of our daily penguins, one of the, one of the few truly um, Antarctic penguins. Um, these again, very, very common in certain, certain areas. Wherever you've got your, your penguin colonies up in, up in Spitsburg, you're looking out for Arctic foxes. Down in Antarctica, you're looking out for the reptilian looking uh, leopard seal, which predates on the penguins um, and, and seals around the colonies. And the other big predator of the region are the, are the orcas. Um, and you'd be very unlucky not to see uh, a pod or two of orcas on this trip, as well as a variety of other whales. Sarah showed you a wonderful variety of whales on her uh, little cruise, cruises around um, the Maldives. Down in Antarctica, you're looking for humpbacks, right whales, blue whales, a variety of other species as well. And then at the end of the trip, um, we'll be heading over the infamous Drake's Passage um, to uh, return back to um, the mainland again. Um, and so just an absolutely fantastic um, uh, destination, some of the best scenery in the world, some of the most spectacular wildlife in the world. And if you're going to do it, why not do it during the, the time of a, of, of a total eclipse? Um, so see it all in its best and see um, one of the, um, the university's great spectacles um, at the same time. So I will uh, end my talk there um, and I will uh, pass over uh, to Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, and if you have any questions, please do let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Great talk. Really enjoyed that. OK, folks, we're just going to take a short break now. And um, so do go and get yourselves a, a refill, a top up of your drink. Um, and we'll be joining you back here again at 8.25. OK, so we'll see you shortly.
Right, okay, welcome back everybody. I think you can all see my screen, Paul. Is this full screen for everybody? Uh, yes, I think so. Yep, excellent, lovely, thank you. Just want to, uh, just want to check. Great, okay, well, taking you now to um, slightly cooler climbs um, from the tropics I was talking about earlier, um, but uh, somewhere a bit uh, closer on our doorstep, I'm now going to take you for the next 20 minutes to St Kilda. Um, and for those of you who um, don't know where St Kilda is, it's an um, archipelago of islands on the Western Isles of Scotland. And we start our cruise to St Kilda in the vibrant coastal town of Oban. And prior to working at Nature Trek, I lived on an island off Oban for three years where I worked as a wildlife guide on a whale watching boat. I lived on the Isle of Seal, which is about half an hour away. Um, and it's a fantastic place, um, brilliant for wildlife. And it's known as the gateway to the Outer Isles. So this is where we start our cruise. And um, so you can see uh, Oban here, so Northwest of Glasgow. And our itinerary for the journey is sailing up here through um, the Sound of Mull, uh, sailing from the Inner Hebrides across the stretch of water here, which is called the Minch, um, up probably to, to Leverborough on uh, Lewis and Harris, and then over the 40 kilometres out from the very most uh, western isles of the Outer Hebrides, all the way across to St Kilda, which is all the way out here. So it's no wonder that it is known as the islands on the edge of the world. I'll just click to my next slide. So this is the uh, vessel that we use for this journey. This is the Seahorse 2. She's um, a small and comfortable vessel. She's built in the Norwegian fjords and built to um, have a life really in the northern high latitudes. She's got ample power to comfortably cruise the many spectacular islands and locks of the Western Isles, but she's still uh, small enough to be able to anchor in the remote places that quite simply the larger vessels and passenger ships just are unable to visit. So this is some of the interior here. Uh, you can see one of the cabins along with one of the bathrooms and some other interior images, uh, another cabin and uh, some seats out on deck while anchored in Tobermory uh, and the saloon area and uh, dining area. So we start by sailing from Oban um, up through where you can see the ferry routes are there through Loch Sunart, and that's, uh, sorry, not through Loch Sunart, through um, the sounds of Mull, which is up here, and then we settle in Loch Sunart for the evening. And this is when we should really start to be seeing our first wildlife. Harbour porpoise, we should be seeing them as we're sailing up the sound of Mull. They look like dolphins, and they are related, but they are different. And um, they're very elusive, and they're smaller than dolphins. They're only about a metre and a half in length, 1.7 metres at most, whereas the local bottlenose dolphins will get up to 3.9 metres, almost four metres. Um, and they've got a difference in personality as well. The dolphins are quite boisterous and energetic, and the porpoise really just like to keep themselves to themselves, um, and they won't really approach boats. Um, and it can be quite tricky to see them, despite the fact that they're actually the most common cetacean of, um, of the UK and British waters. But this photo here that you can see on the bottom left is really the best photo that you'd hope to get of a porpoise. This is the best view that you'd really typically get. Uh, nice flat calm waters and you can see them coming out of the water there. They've got um, a, a straighter backed dorsal fin than a dolphin as well, which has a taller dorsal fin, which curves round to the back somewhat as well. Red deer, we'd hope to start seeing. Uh, there really is just no better way to start a cruise in Scotland than to be sailing up the sound of Mull with the sea breeze in your face and you're looking up onto the cliffs of Mull and breaking the skyline is a really impressive uh, silhouette of an amazing stag with his antlers and uh, with the sky behind it while it's out grazing up on the hills. And sea eagles as well, we'd hope to see them along with golden eagles, but sea eagles, uh, white-tailed eagles are really a particularly um, great thing to see here because they're such a conservation success. Uh, many of you may know that they were actually hunted to extinction and um, the last one being shot in 1918, and um, this is uh, in the UK, but a reintroduction program um, happened, birds were brought over from Norway and they're released um, in 1975 on Rome and some surrounding islands. And it's now estimated that there are over 108 uh, breeding pairs of sea eagles, which is fantastic. It's a really great conservation success story. 
it hasn't been without its controversy. Um, sheep farmers um, haven't been thrilled about the reintroduction of them because they are concerned that they take lambs. But these are sea eagles. They're born to be out at sea and feeding on fish, which is really what their main diet is. Studies have shown that they don't take lambs. They may well scavenge a few afterbirths and things like that. And lambs which die just from the elements out on the hills, they may scavenge. Um, but uh, sheep farmers can actually claim compensation from SNH uh, for any lambs that are taken by sea eagles. But um, I think judging by the amount of claim forms that are submitted, uh, the sea eagles on the western coast of Scotland have got a bit of a, an obesity problem. Um, but uh, we won't say any more on that. We won't get political. Um, it's, it is a great uh, success story, really. And when you think about the market value of a, a lamb is anything from maybe sort of 50 to 80 pounds, sea eagle tourism on the Isle of Mull alone is worth five million pounds a year and on the Isle of Skye, 2.8 million pounds. So it really is bringing a huge amount of money into the economy and they're just great to be able to see. It really is a true sign of just wilderness um, when you're sailing out at sea there and seeing these majestic animals really where they belong. So our first night, we'll anchor in Loch Sunart. I took this photo when I was um, there a year ago and uh, it's one of my favourite places to be and it's a great spot to look for otters which are one of my favourite animals um, and otters can be pretty shy but when you're anchored on a, on a boat they don't seem to notice you um, and they'll just come along and swim by the boat and it's best to try and look for them when it's low tides so they don't have to dive quite so deeply to find their food um, but they're really lovely little creatures are really well adapted um, to life in the sea here, even though they are actually river otters, they're not sea otters, so they um, are, have evolved living in freshwater, but they uh, have adapted to living along the coastal lines of the sea, but they'll always be fairly close to a freshwater source so they can go and wash the salt out of their coats uh, one or two times a day. So moving from Loch Sunart, we'll then sail down uh, to the Treshnish Isles and go and nip in there. So flying, uh, going slightly off course, but it, Treshnish Isles are really worthwhile going to. Uh, this is Lunga on the Treshnish Isles. And why do we go to the Treshnish Isles? To see the puffins. I could almost hear you all saying it. Yes, the puffins. That's why we go there, fantastic. Um, at several thousand puffins, in fact, on Lunga, um, and they're really endearing um, little birds. We get there before any of the other tourist boats do as well. This is, again, the beauty of having our own vessel. We can get there um, at sunrise before other people are on the island and, and have the puffins to ourselves and just watch the thousands of them flying out to sea and coming back again with beaks full of sand eels. Absolutely amazing experience. And you can walk around Lunga and go and explore, and if you're um, lucky enough, you'll very likely hear uh, the sound of a corn crake. And if you're very lucky, you may even hear one uh, picking it, putting its head up above the grass there, which is uh, a fantastic place to be. And this is still a, a good stronghold of this species. As we move out into deeper water, um, we will look for cetaceans. And um, I'm not sure if this video is today. There we are, you can see the video. These are the of those dolphins, which we've got here. These are known as the baraboids. White beaked dolphin is a really uh, a cold water dolphin. You don't get them any further south than the, in the UK. And we do go off uh, on shore as much as possible to go and um, explore the islands and really just to make the most of the daylight because we've got long daylight hours here up in Scotland. It doesn't really ever get truly, truly dark. From 11 p.m. to about 4 a.m. You, you do get a dark twilight, um, but you can still just about manage walking around without a, a torch. Um, and uh, just to see the wonderful wildlife. We've got lots of time to be doing it and taking advantage of it. So these are some of my groups here walking out about Golden Eagle in the photo there along with a cuckoo. And to see the maca is um, a wonderful experience. These just carpeted uh, carpets of flowers going along the beaches, um, which is so iconic of the Western Isles. A yellow flag iris on the bottom right there and sea thrift and uh, orchids. Um, it's a fantastic sight to see. And the beaches, they're just so well known for these beautiful, pristine, white, sandy beaches and turquoise looking seas. It's extremely appealing. 
And then we continue for our push over to St Kilda. And when you see St Kilda on the horizon, it's a really exciting moment. I always offer a beer to the first person who spots uh, the, the islands on the horizon, which immediately makes everybody stampede outside and stay there fixed, looking on the horizon, um, trying to spot it. But still, when we see it, it still seems to take hours before it just grows bigger and bigger and bigger and until we're actually amongst it. So we do still have things to entertain us while we're sailing over to the islands. We need to keep our eye out for other cetaceans, of course. Um, so minke whales we'll hope to start seeing at, at this point, if not already, now that we're into deeper water. We may also see some, some humpback whales, but minke is uh, by far the most likely. And as we sail into St Kilda, this is Village Bay that you can see here. And you can see it's the remains of a volcano which erupted out of the ocean 60 million years ago. Half of the caldera has eroded away, but it's left this bay, uh, which is where we anchor for two nights. But with no land predators present, an avian empire had been born. And such is the length of time that birds have reigned upon these islands. Um, they've even had their own subspecies of wren evolve. This is the St Kilda wren. Uh, here, um, Trochodytes, Trochodytes hortensis, and it's uh, slightly larger than our um, uh, wren that we get in the UK and slightly more streaked, uh, less streaked, I should say, that you can see there, um, and some soe sheep as well, which have full reign over the lands and are quite famously being left to their own devices as part of a, a study um, to see how they're getting on. Obviously, they have a limited gene pool with no um, other uh, sheep coming in off the other islands. And these are some photos taken from exploring the island. The top left here is uh, taken from Conica, which are the highest sea cliffs in Britain, around 450 metres. And you can really see the remains of the, um, the village there where the inhabitants used to live, a population of only about 100 people. Um, and it's amazing just to walk around the old black houses, as they were known, and explore the old cleats and the old stone walls, all of which is very much still intact. And there's a lovely museum that you can go into to read about the, the famous history of the St. Kildan people, uh, where there are really interesting artifacts to, to look through. And it's amazing how much um, of these artifacts have been, um, have been kept and preserved. And these are some photographs of the St. Kildan people. Now the lives of the St. Kildans is and their story is really one of truly remarkable self-sufficiency. There's no way that they could have been able to, to live on these islands um, if it weren't for the birds, which were their main, if only, source of food. And they would uh, create uh, fishing lines to catch puffins, as in the uh, top left image here, um, and kill fulmers and gannets. They were really skilled at going and climbing up on the cliffs um, and catching these birds. Um, and you can see uh, the people in the bottom left there have got uh, some gannets, it looks like, and they would pluck all of the feathers and store the feathers in the stone cleats, um, and they slowly started exporting them um, for use in duvets and bedding, um, but the food was, was kept in these stone cleats, uh, which was, were very cold and helped preserve it and helped them live there for so long. But occasionally food shortages did uh, occur, which was a really serious problem, but they would send an inflated sheep's bladder with a little note. You can see on that wooden boat there, it says, please open. And inside that, there would be a, a small note saying, we've got a food shortage, please send help. And if they launched this, when the wind came from the Northwest, amazingly, two thirds of these messages were later found on the West coast of Scotland or less conveniently in Norway. But nonetheless, it's amazing that two thirds of them were actually recovered. And sadly, they started to lose their self-sufficiency as they had more and more exposure to the outside world um, and realized what another life they, they could be leading. Um, so they evacuated in 1930. This is one of the few photographs taken from that evacuation. And uh, you can make of this image what you will. Um, this lady here being packed up like a, like a pack horse um, to take the items off, uh, off of the island as they're evacuating. <laughs> And after two nights, we depart from St Kilda and we go around the, the stacks, which is a fantastic experience. And this the truly, the best way to experience the stacks is by the sea, not by actually exploring on land, despite the fact that we will have a full day on the island itself. But going around the, these um, cliffs here, 
by vote is just incredible. The archipelago has a really impressive nine designations in total. It's the UK's only dual UNESCO World Heritage Site, both for its natural and cultural significance, um, sharing that honour with only 30 other, 39 other sites in the world, um, including Machu Picchu and Mount Athos in Greece. And um, this is why, really, it's just got a never-ending list of accreditations to prove its worth as a haven for seabirds, 66,000 pairs of fauna, which is the largest colony of this species in Britain, um, and 60,000 pairs of northern gannets, and um, they breed on the sea stacks, which is the large, making it the second largest colony um, in the world after Bass Rock, and 150,000 pairs of puffins, uh, which is a quarter of Britain's population. Um, it's also a significant uh, colony for, for leeches storm petrel. It's the largest colony in Europe. Um, Manx Shear waters and 1% of the world's population of great skewer also breeds um, on St Kilda. So in total, over 200 species of bird have been recorded here. And just to zoom in on that gannet picture that I had there a moment ago, um, it's incredible just to see them all sort of stacked up with their nests um, on these sea cliffs, looking completely at home, but sailing alongside them. The, the noise that you hear um, as they're calling to their mates and coming in from being out at sea, and also the smell that hits you of all of the guano, that acidy kind of smell, which just gets the back of your throat, the sound of the waves of the Atlantic crashing against the cliffs, and over all of this sound, all of the noise of the gannets, you hear the call of the St Kilda Wren. It's incredible, such a tiny little bird uh, can be heard across the noise of all of these gannets. It's a remarkable place. And when you're looking at the gannets flying overhead, there'll be a dark shadow flying around um, for sure, which will be a bonksy or a great skewer, which will be looking for its, uh, its next meal as they'll chase the gannets and try and get them to panic and regurgitate a fish. And uh, here we have a, a photo of one here. Uh, really impressive birds, known as the pirates of the seas, um, but uh, they're, they're quite impressive to see. And then we uh, depart St Kilda and uh, we have uh, a several day journey back um, from the islands and we'll go back a different way from the way that we've came. So we might go um, back on the southern tips um, and stop in uh, around Vatasee or Eriske, um, but we'll make our way back to Mull and then slowly make our way back to Oban. And I don't have a sunset shot to end the talk on, but I thought a lovely rather dramatic and uh, see nice scenic shot of the sound of mole would be a nice way to end it. So thank you very much for listening. Um, if you do have any questions, please fire away. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Andy, who is going to be speaking to you about the Galapagos. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, that talk on St Kilda there, doesn't it just remind you of what fantastic wildlife and pristine environments we've got in the UK? Absolutely. And the staff are unanimous I think that um, during the pandemic we've all become to appreciate the wildlife on our home islands uh, more than ever. Uh, so yeah great stuff Sarah thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to take you back over to South America um, this evening. I talked about uh, mainland South America uh, last night um, and if you missed that talk and would like to see it we can send you a link so just contact us in the office. Um, so I'm Natrix General Manager I've uh, been with the business since 1998. Uh, I've never quite seen times like the ones we're living through at the moment, obviously. Uh, tough times. But as Sarah said in the introduction, it's just been a real pleasure to lay on these talks. And we're really heartened by the number of you that have joined us online, um, either reminiscing about past travel memories or perhaps looking for some inspiration uh, for some uh, trip ideas for the future. So over to uh, South America then. Um, let's just get our bearings quickly. We're, we're looking at the Republic of Ecuador. This is the equator that uh, runs through the north of the country, just north of the capital Quito there, which is the gateway to uh, any Galapagos cruise. Um, but the talk centers, of course, on the Galapagos Islands, which on the scale here, a thousand kilometers out into the Pacific Ocean would be about where I'm circling uh, my mouse uh, or my cursor there. Uh, this is the outline of the Galapagos Islands. Um, here's the equator running through the north of Isabella, the largest of the islands. And uh, just some basic geology. We're looking at the newest islands, geologically speaking, over here in the western side of the archipelago, Fernandina, 
and Isabella both sit over active uh, mantle plumes. So Fernandina particularly is an active volcano and so are uh, the summits here on Isabella. As we move southeast to San Cristobal and Española, we are looking at uh, the oldest geologically of the Galapagos Islands, about 90 million years old. And these are low and weathered, whereas Isabella and Fernandina uh, are mountainous. And scientists think that Fernandina probably poked above the waves uh, about four million years ago. Uh, so over millennia, rafts of vegetation have swept down off the Andes and into the Pacific Ocean. The vast, vast majority, if they've housed reptiles or small flocks of birds, etc., would have become wrapped up in storms or they would have sunk and the wildlife on board those rafts uh, would have uh, died, never to be seen again. But a small percentage over millennia have arrived on these islands, um, found an environment that they could uh, exist in and thrive. Uh, and over tens of thousands of years uh, through evolution and speciation, uh, we end up with the endemic wildlife that we see today. Uh, now, you can visit the Galapagos Islands by flying into Santa Cruz and staying in a hotel and taking day trips out. Uh, but you really only want to consider that if you are the world's most terrible sailor, because there's only one real way to see the Galapagos Islands properly, and that's to join a cruise. And if you can afford it and you've got the time, you want to be doing a 14 night cruise, because then you get around to all of the visitor sites and uh, the key areas up around the western side of Isabella and Punta Espinosa here on Fernandina. My fear if you go for seven nights is you'll be so blown away with the Galapagos wildlife that you'll be kicking yourself on the plane home thinking, why didn't I invest in that extra seven nights? I was just getting into it. So um, the 14 night cruise uh, is the way to go if you possibly can. Uh, the Galapagos Islands were first seen by Western man in uh, March 1535 when the fourth Bishop of Panama, a chap called Thomas de Belenga, was en route from Panama to uh, Lima in Peru to sort out a dispute between Francisco Pizarro, one of the conquistadors, and Pizarro's lieutenants. And his wooden galleon got blown away from the South American continent and they arrived on these godforsaken shores with no fresh water, uh, with weird uh, lizards living on, on the islands. And they, they didn't think uh, much of their landing point, although they, they managed to ga gather enough supplies to survive the voyage back to the mainland. Main uh, tourism in Galapagos really kicked off in the 1970s. And these days, pa uh, pandemic aside, uh, it, it really is a key source of revenue for Ecuador through government taxes, uh, tourism taxes and employment. So I've touched on hotel based days in Galapagos, but like I said, you really want to be on board a boat and you can choose anything from an eight person catamaran up to something that looks like a, a cross channel ferry with over a hundred people on board. Uh, our preference at Nature Trek is for a mid-sized boat, 16 people in really nice spacious quarters here on, on uh, Beluga. And the key things are, for me anyway, comfortable bed, plenty of hot water, a great guide, that's really vital as it is on all wildlife holidays, and uh, a first class crew because they're your uh, family while you're in Galapagos Islands and they'll be tending to your every need and wish. So a boat with a great atmosphere, great crew and a great guide is key, married up with the itinerary and uh, a group of like-minded uh, clients on board, each sharing a, a passion for wildlife and uh, th those are the key ingredients you're looking for. Uh, Beluga has a, a mix of twin bedded rooms and, and double beds, uh, some with uh, some good views, uh, all with great access and she's an ideal base for a week or two week cruise. And uh, we also use a beluga sister boat, the Cachalotti Explorer. Uh, she's an ex-Canadian fishing boat, which has been kitted out throughout and modernized. And she also, also provides great, uh, a great base for Galapagos to cruise with a wonderful family orientated crew on board, a long serving crew, uh, great food on board. Uh, the cabins are slightly tighter than they are on beluga, which reflects a slightly lower bright. Um, and to be honest, in some of the cabins, you can barely swing a cat. But um, I try to reassure people who question the size of the cabins by saying, on a cruise like this, you really are only below decks to wash and brush up in the evenings, to brush your teeth and go to sleep. Perhaps have a siesta in the afternoon. But aside from that, you're up on deck, enjoying the scenery as we go past. Uh, you're joining the lectures in the evening and briefings. Um, you're getting ready for snorkeling or 
Zodiac sessions. Uh, the cabin really is only a, a place to retire to rest and relax in the evening. So we'll set sail from uh, Puerto Aora, typically in the central island of Santa Cruz and head south, often down to Española, which is one of the highlights of the islands and quickly we'll be coming to grips with some of the seabirds, the Galapagos petrel, the endemic uh, seabird. To get from our parent boat onto the islands, we will disembark onto Zodiacs. Um, that lady on the left is Jenny Wilshire, one of you, some of you might recognise her, one of our botanical tour leaders. She holidayed out here one year with her husband, John, also a nature tour leader. Um, so we'll go onto the Zodiacs and motor ashore. Once you're at the shore, you'll either step directly onto a wooden or stone jetty called a dry landing, or the Zodiac driver will manoeuvre the Zodiac into, the, into a gently sloping sandy beach. And then you sit on the side of the Zodiac, swing your legs over the side, and ease yourself off in, into the sea up to knee or thigh deep. And then you wade ashore, towel yourself off, put your walking shoes on and off you go. And that's called a, a wet landing. So we'll, we'll give you a brief each evening on what landings to expect on any given day. Now the wildlife in Galapagos is famously approachable and fearless because they've, they've grown up and evolved uh, without any fear of predators or, or man. Uh, so the welcoming committee on Española often comprises of a Galapagos hawk. Um, this photo also serves a practical purpose for me because it just highlights the kind of footwear that you need for a, uh, this particular cruise, uh, either the jelly shoes uh, here or, or sandals the fasten with Velcro. Uh, those are both ideal, though uh, sometimes you have to be careful of sharp lava if we're walking on some uh, quite spiky terrain. Um, the welcoming committee doesn't end at the Galapagos hawks. Uh, we can sometimes see hood mockingbirds here, which will come down. Uh, this behaviour here uh, is a remnant, really, from the early days of tourism, where tourists uh, used to give free handouts, bits of banana or tropical fruits or a cap of water. Uh, that's long since been outlawed, of course, because it interrupts and unbalances the natural um, balance of life here, which is delic delicately poised. But the legacy seems to live on and the, the mockingbirds particularly seem to think that if they pester you, uh, they might avail themselves of a cupful of water. But we're under strict instructions that we can, uh, that the wildlife can touch you should it choose, but you can't touch or feed it. Uh, moving on down the path that the Galapagos National Park have done a wonderful job in Galapagos of constructing paths in and around wildlife rich areas. So we'll quickly come to grips get to grips with some Galapagos endemic wildlife, uh, Galapagos dove, and the ubiquitous yellow warbler, which is actually a bird we see on the mainland, but this is a, a distinct subspecies in Galapagos. These birds live in the Galapagos just around the intertidal zone there, feeding on seeds and insects in the, uh, in the tide line. Uh, Charles Darwin arrived in Galapagos on the voyage of the Beagle, 300 years later than Thomas de Belenga. Uh, the Beagle arrived in uh, 1835, and a young Charles Darwin, this is him later on in life, top right there, uh, was struck at the diversity of finches in the islands. Um, these days, of course, we call them Darwin's finches, and there are 13 species, and certainly the keener birders in the group will be keen to try to see all 13 species, but they're presumably descended from uh, one common arrival, one common ancestor, and uh, the, the observation and the study of the finches went a long way to Charles Darwin's thinking as he compiled Origin of the Species, which was published in 1859 and remains a, a seminal volume today. The Darwin's finches in real life, um, they're quite difficult to distinguish. They've all got this kind of mottled brown plumage. Uh, what does decipher one species from the other uh, is the size and the shape of the bill. This bill here would put a bullfinch or a, a hawfinch to shame. Look at the size of that. This is a large billed ground finch. So we can identify the finches through both their habit, um, where they live on the islands, which islands they live on, and particularly the size of the beak there. Uh, on Española, we're quickly weaving our way in and around seabird colonies. I think this Nazca booby here is feeling a bit left out as we scan out to sea. Uh, notice the bare skin here. Uh, High fat to sun green, uh, absolutely vital. Too many times I've seen a group from the UK 
or North America arrive in the depths of winter, our winter in January. And the temptation is under the tropical sun to peel off and enjoy some rays. But I've seen some really bad cases of sunburn. Uh, people not uh, giving due care and, and, and attention to the equatorial sun. So high factor sun cream and uh, sun hats, sun glasses is all the day here. Some wonderful photographic opportunities uh, in this Nazca booby breeding colony. And, uh, you know, I remember leading these cruises back in the late 90s when people used to bring home carry bags full of 60 or 70 uh, used rolls of film. Uh, nowadays, people will shoot 10, 15, 20,000 digital images. Uh, and that's just average. I mean, it's incredible um, what the advent of digital photography has done for us. Where you all get the time to sort those images, uh, I don't know. I know some people uh, wait years to get around to doing it. Um, Espanola has uh, the largest and most colourful subspecies of marine iguanas in the archipelago, but the jewel in Espanola's crown would undoubtedly be the waved albatross. This magnificent seabird is endemic to Ecuador. Uh, it only breeds here on Espanola and one other island, Isla de la Plata, just off the coast of Ecuador. And to walk past this breeding colony um, and to sit down and just observe them is a real privilege. And it always strikes me in Galapagos when I'm with a wildlife group from Nature Trek, we take time, it might sit down for half an hour or more uh, just to watch one pair as they do their famous beak clacking caution display. Uh, but I'm always amazed at tourists from other boats um, seem to give the birds a cursory glance and then just march straight off um, back for a cold beer on the boat. That's just another uh, added value really in, in traveling with a wildlife group instead of perhaps saving a few pounds by going on a, a shared boat. Um, they have a, an unbelievable nine foot wingspan, these birds. So we will go to the cliff edge on Española and hopefully see some of the birds take off uh, into the Pacific breeze. Along the same cliff edge, we might see red-billed tropic bird. And uh, also on es Española, excuse me, I'm still on the same island, it's so full of highlights. We have one of the world's most beautiful beaches uh, on the south of the island, just near the mooring site. And here uh, on the shore, we have a harem of sea lions. Uh, there's the, the one male beach master with his 80 or so adult female sea lions with various cups. Uh, we have to be careful of the beach master, keep a, clear, a careful eye on him, but normally they're fairly relaxed and we can snorkel in these crystal clear waters and uh, enjoy playing with the pups. Now, there's been quite a few questions this evening in the chat uh, about snorkeling, particularly regarding Sarah's talks uh, in the Maldives and Indonesia. Lots of questions about how um, competent do I need to be? What happens for non-swimmers? And we'll have a chat about that after I finish the talk. Uh, but just here in Galapagos, just one or two words, particularly about this trip. The water is quite chilly, about 18 to 22 degrees, which is similar to off the south coast of the UK in summer. Uh, for me personally, I recoil at that uh, kind of temperature. So I found that my shorty wetsuit cut off at the elbows and knees like this lady here, kept me nice and snug and warm. But we will take the opportunity to do a, an initi initiation session. A guide will just take us just uh, waist deep, chest deep, just so people unused to snorkeling apparatus can uh, just get used to breathing and feel a bit more confident. So uh, during the week, confidence builds. And before you know it, even the, the less confident swimmers uh, and even non-swimmers in some cases uh, will be wearing life vests and they'll have gained confidence uh, enough to jump in, in in the deep end, if you like, off the edge of the zodiac. Uh, for non-swimmers, um, like I say, this was touched on in the comments, um, you can either have an, another walk along the beach or another uh, panga ride, a zodiac ride, uh, looking for seabirds. Or like I say, you can have a crew member with you, uh, don a, a life jacket and uh, just enjoy floating around without ever feeling a, any kind of danger. Underwater, <clears throat> well, some fabulous marine wildlife to see. And actually, when I'm in Galapagos, I, I enjoy the marine life probably uh, just as much, if not more than the land life. So face-to-face -face encounters with green turtles, um, king angel fish, uh, yellow-tailed searching fish, and actually one of the, the slides that Sarah showed earlier from the Maldives features some of the species we also see in the Galapagos. So a lot of these, these fish are pan-tropical. And, uh, you know, we're used to on nature tours people wanting to tick off the birds and the, the butterflies and the orchids in the evening. It's nice sometimes on these cruises to do a fish list 
in the evening as well and see how many species we can tot up during one of these cruises. Uh, one of my favourite days on the cruise is on uh, Isabella, the largest of the islands. We leave behind the coastal environment for a day, take a bus and then hike up to the volcanic caldera here on Isabella. It's a lovely walk up there, some stunning volcanic scenery. If you're a geologist, I've had volcanologists on this cruise and they say to me, this is wonderful, Andy, because everything I've ever lectured about or seen in the textbook we see right here. Um, so if you're into ge your geology and volcanology, uh, as well as your wildlife, then you, you would get a great deal out of a Galapagos visit. On the walk up, we'll see some of the archipelago's largest land iguanas, um, bright yellow here on Isabella. Um, and just, uh, just be, sorry, I've, I've, I meant to just touch on the uh, goat eradication program there while I'm sit, still on Isabella. Um, the early buccaneers and the pirates brought to Galapagos wild boar, donkeys, rats, uh, and other feral animals, which wreaked havoc in such a delicate ecosystem. And uh, the, the, the land iguanas and the giant tortoises in particular suffered just because the goats are ravenous consumers of the indigenous vegetation. Uh, so over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, the Galapagos National Park Authority have employed various techniques to eradicate those pest animals from the islands. Uh, with some unbelievable results. I remember uh, leading in Galapagos in 1999 and seeing the vegetation on Isabella pretty much stripped all the way back. And you look over mile and upon mile of impossible terrain and think, how on earth are you ever going to eradicate these pests uh, from the islands? But credit to the National Park Authority, uh, using a Judas goat technique, catch a goat, put a bell around it, uh, around his neck. Being a goat, it will go off and find other goats and then using sharpshooting tactics uh, with New Zealand specialists in helicopters, they have managed to eradicate the goats and use different techniques for other species. And the rebound of the vegetation and uh, what that means for the, the endemic wildlife uh, cannot go understated. Uh, sorry, I'm a, sl a slide behind. Uh, that was walking over the 1956 lava flow of Santiago, just giving you an idea of the difficult terrain underfoot. So walking poles and stout footwear the order of the day. We're back up here at the deep water channel between Isabella and Fernandina. This is where the nutrient rich uh, waters well up from the deep, a great spot for seabird watching, petrels, brown noddies, storm petrels, etc. And if we're going to see uh, one of the larger cetaceans here uh, in Galapagos, this will be a good place to, to watch. We've seen pods of orcas here before. This is a say whale. Pretty much anything can turn up. Another one of my favorite vista sites, the remote Punta Espinosa on Fernandina, uh, where there's a large colony of uh, marine iguanas. So once again, we'll really take our time here, we'll spread out as much as we're allowed to in national park rules. You might find your own marine iguana to nestle up closely to and just have the Pacific breeze in your hair and just revel in being in this almost prehistoric environment. Uh, do just be careful, these animals have a habit of sneezing out deposits of salt from their nostrils. So if you've got an expensive camera or a pair of binoculars around your neck, you do, do just need to, to beware. Uh, I guess many of you will have seen the BBC documentary on the Galapagos, I think three or four years ago. Do you remember Liz Bonin and a whole team of scientists took a submersible beneath the waves? And in that series, there was a, a quite striking series uh, filmed on Fernandina with the uh, Galapagos racer snakes uh, pursuing freshly hatched marine iguanas, um, baby iguanas. It, it, it was quite disturbing in a way. Um, we can't get to that place. That's a secluded site around the north of the island, which is out of bounds to tourists. But I sometimes am asked whether we see that spectacle on our cruises. Uh, some of the other special wildlife, the flightless cormorants, evolved presumably from the mainland near tropical cormorant, uh, but left here for over millennia without any land-based predators has over time done without the need for flight. Another one of the endemic species, the larva heron, uh, enjoying a lunchtime snack of a small wrasse there. And back into the central part of the island, over, after we've gone over the equator and back down the northern side of, Isab of Isabella, we're back on Santa Cruz. And this is another nice day away from the coastal ecosystem. Uh, we're up here at two old sinkholes up in the highlands of Santa Cruz. You can see a group of tourists top left there. In Spanish, these are called Los Gemelos, the twins. Uh, this is a nice uh, 
uh, day that we get up into the Scalesia forest. We look for woodpecker finch and one or two of the other trickier uh, Darwin's finches. We have a, a nice roast chicken lunch in the local hacienda and we spend some time in one of the wild giant tortoise meadows where once again, similar to the marine iguanas and uh, the waved albatrosses, we can just take our time, nestle down in the grass and perhaps find our own wild tortoise to uh, spend some time with. Uh, this reminds me always of the, the sad tale of Lonesome George, which some of you may be aware of. Lonesome George was a, uh, a giant tortoise found alone on the island of Pinta, another island without any visitor sites. And he, he was brought back to Santa Cruz and cared for in the Charles Darwin station, but they never ever found a mate for um, Lonesome George, even though they tried to get him interested in some female tortoises from other islands. I'm afraid for however many years he was left abandoned, um, he'd lost the will, so to speak. Um, so when Lonesome George died, I think it was about five or six years ago, it was a poignant, uh, moment really uh, of um, of uh, yeah a species dying out in front of our eyes uh, a very sad time but Lonesome George lives on as a symbol I think of, of hope because um, several other races of Galapagos being reared very successfully in the Charles Darwin Station and uh, being successfully reared and released back off into their native islands once DNA testing has been done. Uh, right up here, right in the north of the Galapagos Islands, are the island of Genovesa or Tower. Uh, this is a dry landing. There's some steps cut into the cliff face there. These are Prince Philip steps. Uh, in case you're wondering if that looks like a severe rock climb, it's actually quite a bit easier when you get up close looks from this photo here. But it's worth the effort because on top there's a breeding colony of swallowtail gulls, uh, one of the world's most beautiful gulls, mostly diurnal. Inhabit, inhabit, which is very unusual for a gull. And the red-footed boobies, which are the only species of the three here that nest in trees. Cameras once again clicking away. <clears throat> the large numbers of storm petrels live on Genovese. They, they uh, use the crevices in the lava here. And there's a small population of diurnal short-eared owls, which prey exclusively on the petrels as they emerge uh, from their burrows in, in the dusk. Uh, you can see uh, prey captured there. Uh, back in the central part of the islands uh, on North Seymour, one of the uh, most popular, I guess, uh, one of the most characterful birds you'll see in the Galapagos are the famous blue-footed boobies with their courtship display, the sky pointing courtship display there. And again, this is an opportunity one afternoon to take our time and just uh, revel in being in the midst of this breeding colony. Also on North Seymour, there's a colony of uh, magnificent frigate birds. The males are inflating their red pouches in order to appear attractive to females, which are scouting overhead for a, uh, a suitable partner. Um, and uh, a shot like that will be on, on most people's wish lists. Once again, the rule is that the wildlife can approach and touch you if they want, but you can't reciprocate. Um, the Youngsters, the, the Galapagos sea lions are, are so playful in nature, so inquisitive, they tend to steal everybody's hearts. And if you're a keen swimmer, uh, you will have a wonderful time playing with these animals underwater as they blow bubbles into your mask and uh, tug on your fins and uh, just generally great underwater companions. The uh, Galapagos penguins, um, are uh, one of the species we'll be looking for, present at four or five sites reliably around the islands and it's probably the only place in the world you can snorkel with penguins uh, without the need for a dry suit and the ubiquitous sally life of crabs here uh, omnipresent around the intertidal zone uh, all around the islands. And I'll just finish the the evening's presentation <clears throat> with probably the most famous viewpoint in Galapagos I'm on uh, Bartolome here, looking towards Pinnacle Rock. <clears throat> Santiago in the background, that lava flow there is where the group were walking earlier on across that quite rough substrate. So this island visit incorporates a walk up uh, around the back of where I'm standing to, to this viewing platform on top. Then we'll go back down, land on the beach and you can snorkel around Pinnacle Rock with the penguins 
and walk across this isthmus of land here to the beach opposite, where there are often white tipped reef sharks and various ray species just cruising beneath the waves there. So it's a very special place, this. Um, I guess quite a few of you have been there, many more might plan to go. Uh, tourism at the moment is uh, completely stalled, but uh, we're hoping very much that later on this year uh, we might be back up and running again. Uh, so thank you very much. Hope you've enjoyed that. Um, and uh, I'll hand back to Sarah uh, to wrap the evening up. And uh, if you'd like to hang, ar hang around until 9.30 or so, we'll have a chat and, and answer any questions that have come up. Great. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, well, we've had a few questions come in. Um, as you've touched on already, um, people asking about whether they need to be a competent snorkeler or swimmer. Um, you've already touched on that, but I'm happy to um, answer that from my point of view with regards to the Maldives and uh, Indonesia cruises. Um, don't worry about being um, a, a competent snorkeler. Um, I'd say probably 70% of the people on the cruises won't have snorkeled in the sea before or, it, or it's new to them or they may haven't may not have done it for 10 years or so um but what would be helpful is if you've got an opportunity to to practice at your local beach or even just in the swimming pool before you go on the cruise um just to get used to it or even i've had clients um practice in the bath and telling me that they've just been practicing having their face down in the bath it's really just that sort of psychological barrier of, of getting used to having your head in the water but still being able to breathe and have your snorkel um, up and, and positioned out of the water and just as much practice as you can get will um, obviously enhance the experience that you're getting while you're you're out there but um, at the beginning of both of the, the trips in the Maldives and uh, in Indonesia I'll take my group down um, uh, along a, just a little house reef when we're staying either on Bandos in the Maldives or um, by the the coast in, in Bali and we can have some practice snorkel sessions just in the shallows just to splash about and get you used to it. Um, if you're not a strong swimmer or, or can't swim, um, there is still opportunity to get out in the water and join some of the snorkels um, where you can hang on to a, a life ring and, um, and swim about and a dive guide may be able to, to pull you along. Um, the only thing I, I would say is we're swimming with, with manta rays um, and whale sharks. They tend to uh, congregate in areas where the water can be a little bit currenty and that's the reason that they're there because the currents are bringing up the, the plankton um, and making that uh, the currents make all the plankton available for them so they go there to feed on it um, so you might need a helping hand uh, to go into into those situations and it might be something that you're actually just not comfortable with if you if you're not a strong swimmer um, and my final point to add to that is for probably 90% of the snorkels on these cruises we go in from the two boats that I showed you in the presentation so the Doni which was the large boat for the Maldives and then the little Zodiacs in Indonesia um, and we just slide in gently we're not jumping in from great heights you slide in gently um, but the boats will be maybe maybe 10 meters um, off the reef and then you just swim onto the reef but we all go together but then you, then, you, then you swim onto the reef and it's lovely and shallow, but you are in, in relatively deep water when you get in um, onto the boat there. Because I know a few of you have messaged already saying that you've got a bit of a fear of deep water. Um, so that's really up to you whether you, you'd feel comfortable doing that. Um, maybe 10% of the time we do go snorkeling, walking in off the beach, but the vast majority were jumping in off the boat. So let's just the three of us touch on seasickness because this has come up on all three talks. Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, an issue for Paul probably to talk about more than most with the Drake's Passage, but I will just touch on sea sickness in Galapagos because at certain times of the year, there is a pronounced oceanic roll. Uh, it's never stormy, uh, as we'd understand stormy conditions from a British point of view. But like I say, there is that pronounced oceanic roll at certain times of the year. So if you do have uh, issues with motion sickness, then I would al always encourage you to go to Galapagos in our winter. Um, the sea will be at its calmest. Uh, from about um, January to March, and there'll be a more pronounced oceanic roll in uh, in August. Um, having said that, there are pros and cons because the albatross is breeding in August, so there's always a trade-off. Uh, but I, I tell people not to worry too much about the time of the year that you go because you'll be blown away by the wildlife. Whatever happens to be breeding, whatever happens to be absent, uh, you won't worry about because you'll just be blown away by the overall experience. In Galapagos, the, the standard over-the-counter medication tends to work 
Uh, also, I've tried the, the pressure points on the on the wrist as well, uh, which I found work uh, as well. Um, I think in St Kilda, Sarah, you, you're looking for a slice of luck, aren't you, with the weather? You've had glassy conditions up there and you've also had uh, occasions when we haven't managed to get over there. Yeah, so um, I've led four cruises to St Kilda and I've gotten there three times. Um, so um, we are at the mercy of the weather once we decide to leave the uh, the outer isles of the of the outer hebrides um, we have to have good sea conditions to be able to go it's simply just not safe if we haven't got good sea conditions to sail over there uh, you've got 40 40 miles of sailing um, and the captain's decision is is final on that um, i've been fortunate that 75 percent of the time i've been successful um, and we time the trip at the best time of year where we are likely to have the calmest weather. Um, so we hope that everything is, is on our side. We've also actually extended the itinerary, taken it from a seven day trip to a 10 day trip to enable us to have two windows of opportunity to get over to St Kilda. So uh, we'll try on our first available opportunity, which would be sort of third or fourth day. Um, and if we can't get over then because of where the front comes in, we can pootle about some of the islands on the outer Hebrides and then we've got time to get out there um, on the, the fifth or sixth day if the weather has passed and we add that to, um, that's, uh, to our advantage as well. Um, if the weather is inclement, um, we, the, the fortunate thing with the sort of topography of the, of the islands is there's so um, many of them, you've just got a lot of uh, opportunities to be sheltered so it doesn't, it's not too difficult to go into nice sheltered bays and still enjoy uh, the wildlife and scenery around there. Yeah, Sarah, can you turn uh, Paul's video on? I think it was turned off. Yeah. Did you, ca did you catch me there? Can you turn Paul's video on? Yeah, yeah, I've, uh, I think he's... Yeah, you're back on. again. There we go. Paul, sea singers, you, you're not the world's greatest sailor by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> are you? Uh, no, I might, no, that, that, that is true, but uh, I've, I've done a couple of trips to Antarctica and thoroughly enjoyed uh, both of them. Um, it's a very common question for Antarctica, what's the seas like? Well, you know, there, there, there's gonna be smooth periods and there will be lumpy periods. Um, down there, you tend to get a succession of low pressures followed by high pressure, followed by low pressure. So it just depends when you meet the low pressure. If you're in the middle of the Drake's Passage, when you meet the low pressure, it'll be a bit lumpy. But I know in, say in the two times I've been down there, I've had one crossing of the Drake's Passage um, where it's been like a mill pond. They call it Drake's Lake. Um, but uh, Andy mentioned a few possible remedies for sea sickness. The other thing you can get with my doctor is a sea sickness patch, a little round patch that goes on your neck. Um, I took one of those the last time I was down there and found it very effective. But what I always say is don't let it put you off going down to Antarctica because it is such a stunningly fabulous spot. Um, and most people get their sea legs pretty quickly. Um, and for most people, or, or, or a few tablets or a patch, and, and you'll be fine. Um, the Arctic is very different. Uh, you certainly don't get the seas around Spitsbergen as you get down around Antarctica. Um, so yeah, again, you can get windy periods up there, but quite typically in the summer, you often get high pressures over the Arctic for an extended period of time. So the seas can be very, very calm. Um, but um, yeah, for any of these cruises, don't let the, the, the fear of sea sickness put you off from doing it because there's yeah, uh, yeah. lots of thank you uh, Judy Priest reminded me of the brand name of the tablet Stugeron I agree that works well and uh, Sue Hetherington thanks for your comment I once saw a tv program with Bill Oddie almost prostrate with sea sickness on the voyage to St Kilda but it's surely a price worth paying to get to the island on the edge of the world um Elizabeth Taylor I found wristbands work um yeah, thanks for all your comments. I'll just pick up a, a couple of questions that I had on Galapagos there. Um, do we see hammerhead sharks? Um, not generally on a normal tourist cruise, but you will if you go on a dive boat. Um, I'm sometimes asked, can you, can you come on a nature cruise and dive in Galapagos? And the answer is no, because uh, the diving is quite technical with drop-offs and underwater currents, and in some cases, quite poor visibility. So quite a lot of care and attention needs to go into the dive briefings. It's not really possible to dip in and out but if you go on a genuine dive charter where the focus of the trip is diving you'll go up to the uh, underwater volcanoes of uh, Wolf and Darwin in the north of the Galapagos and uh, there you will see uh, these large schools of uh, hammerhead sharks which you've probably seen on tv documentaries. 
There's a, another couple of questions here. Um, there are quite a few people saying that uh, they're tempted by the Maldives. That's great to see in the chat there. And a few people have um, asked me whether we provide the snorkeling equipment. Uh, yes, we do. Um, on both the um, Indonesia Botans in the Maldives um, and uh, also in the Galapagos Andes, is that correct? Yes, yeah, we provide snorkeling yeah. equipment there. Yeah. Um, However, I would recommend um, for the Maldives and Indonesia, speaking from first-hand experience, uh, trying to take your own if you can. Um, you don't need to invest in expensive gear by any means. Um, there's a, um, there, there can just be a limited amount of stock on board. So if you have uh, you know, six people, none of whom have taken their fins with them, but they're all the same, they're all requesting the same size fins or got the same size feet. Um, and we might only have sort of two or three um, items of them um, and also you want a mask that's going to fit your face and not leak and that you're comfortable with um, I've had uh, people not take any equipment with them and borrow the equipment on board and, and none of them have had a problem it's more me just being slightly apprehensive of I think um, you, you go into the lengths of going on a the, the Maldives in Indonesia you know the snorkeling is a really heavy part of the itinerary we're doing it twice a day two or three hours a day. Um, so you don't want to be having equipment that might not exactly fit your 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 face or your feet. So um, personally for me, I would want to take my own equipment, but it's, it's up to you. Uh, are there any poisonous snakes in Galapagos? Uh, the answer is no to that one. Um, so that's a nice straightforward one. There's another question just come in from Someone's silly question, really, but is it all safe and clear of shark encounters? <laughs> I don't I don't think Paul needs to answer that one because we've had nobody asking if we do snorkeling sessions in the pole. So though one of our staff members in Nature Trade did a swim in the, in the North Pole or somewhere. You, you in can do crazy. a polar plunge both in the Antarctic and in the Arctic if you want to. I've never done it. No, no. So, yeah, go, go Uh, a documented case of a shark attack in Galapagos. I'm pretty sure that's the case. We will commonly see white tip reef sharks tend to be quite docile. And uh, when I first went to, the, to Galapagos in 1997, I went on a budget boat and it, it broke down between islands and we were uh, surrounded by a big school of Galapagos dolphins and Galapagos sharks and being in trepid young backpackers, we all jumped in and swam with the sharks. And uh, I don't know where that was from. Um, but no, there's never been a, an attack there. We need to be aware though, and you'll be given the etiquette, uh, you know, the safe protocol, be aware of any flashing silver bits that you've got dangling off your equipment. Um, but in Galapagos, yeah, very, very safe for, for snorkeling and swimming. Yeah, similar for Maldives and Indonesia. It's all very gentle and, and calm. And really for me, I'm just disappointed when the sharks don't hang around really, because we've got black tip reef sharks and white tip reef sharks. Um, which are really very small, they're only a meter or so in length, um, and they're really uh, gentle, docile little things, and they'll just be swimming about gently, and if you swim over towards them, they can shoot off in a, in a second. Um, you're much bigger than they are. Um, in terms of other sharks, uh, we can see nurse sharks, um, which are, are very docile. They're usually just seen sitting under table coral on the seabed, um, and of course the whale sharks as well, which is a, a filter feeder. So um, all, all safe as can be, I'd say. Just having a look through. Yeah, a good comment from Claire Eady, uh, just reminded me that as far as snorkeling masks are concerned, if, you're, if you wear glasses, you can get a prescription mask. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a really good idea. And in fact, when we're talking about providing uh, snorkeling equipment. If you're a keen snorkeler, it's well worth getting your own mask, as Claire says there, particularly if you're a glass wearer, glasses wearer. And then you can get it specifically fitted for your head. And it's not going into the communal bucket at the end of the day, which can create a bit of a, a scrum when you're trying to find the, the, the gear that you've gone on so well with yesterday. So if, if you're a keen swimmer snorkeler, for the sake of what, 20, 30 pounds, I would recommend you get your own set really. Mm. And I presume from the way that question's phrased um, that you don't have uh, contact lenses, but I wear glasses and, and for all of my snorkeling, I, I put my contact lenses in and uh, I'm absolutely fine with that um, and don't have a problem. But Chaz, my co-leader, uh, wears glasses and he has a prescription mask, um, which works very well for him. 
I just want to touch on this um, issue for those of you that have got a cruise book for this summer in a couple of questions. You know, the, the questions are, when do we think that cruises are going to start operating again? It's a very difficult one to broach at the moment, that one. Um, there's a lot of guessing going on, both within the travel industry and in the UK environment, isn't there? When are we all going to get back to normal? Uh, what I will say is, obviously, we're following government advice and protocol. We're in close touch with all of our cruise partners. And we'll be giving you all an update um, over two months before a planned departure. So this is before you're expected to send in your deposits. By the way, this goes for all holidays, not just cruises. Uh, we are contacting people about 10 weeks before departure with an update. Um, I can't say too much more about that, really. We had a chat uh, in preparation of this talk amongst the ops team on exactly how post-COVID cruises might look. Will everybody be vaccinated? Will everybody be required to have a PCR test certificate, a negative certificate? Will all of the crew and the chefs and et cetera, the mechanics be required to self-isolate before the cruise? All of these questions are, you know, we're grappling with and wondering what future direction we'll take, but we'll do our best. That's all I can promise at the moment and try to keep all of you booked, uh, properly informed as the landscape becomes clearer this year. Great, and I think that's maybe most questions. Is there anything more from you, Andy or Paul? No, I don't think so. Thank you, Sarah. So just to say, if anybody has any more questions on any of the trips that I've been talking about, you're very welcome to email me at paul at naturetrek.co.uk or, 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 or give the Nature Trek office a call. Yeah, I'll just finish by, by saying from my point of view, uh, on behalf of all Natrix staff, we wish you well for the weeks ahead. We know this is a tough one. We're all suffering with you. Uh, whatever your own individual circumstances are, uh, stay strong. And uh, we will look forward to better times ahead and maybe getting off to some of these wonderful uh, tours and environments around the world. So, yeah, wish you strength and fortitude for the weeks ahead. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andy. And thank you all yeah, from me as well. Thank you all so much for joining. This is the second of 13 evenings that we've got lined up. So please do sign up for others. Um, and we very much appreciate any feedback that you have as well. It's been so nice to see all of the comments coming in this evening. There's a lot of them with all of you saying how much you've enjoyed the evening. It's just so great to hear. Um, but if you do want to email us any feedback, please do let us know at info at naturetrek.co.uk. It's all been quite new for us. So we're still um, enjoying hearing what you think of it and um, we'll be back at the same time on Friday at uh, 7 30 where we'll be taking you to Eastern Europe and we hope you can join us um, we'll stay online for the next five minutes or so in case anyone else has any last minute questions but until the next time take care and good night everybody thank you for joining